now that I've moved back to Maryland, I've involved in a lot of, I have an extension and research program focused on land use and water quality. And um, that includes things regarding ag BMPs and the MAX program through the MDA, as well as stormwater. And I work uh, also the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, which is a long-term ecological research station. And um, I think this has kind of been summed up, but I want to be able to put the numbers up here for you, which is the $14 billion is the estimated cost for Maryland alone, the other states on top of that for Virginia, Pennsylvania, and others. And you can see that stormwater, as people have been saying, is, is, a primary, is one of the large uh, parts of that, about half of it. And the urban sector, if you look at the first three, urban stormwater, uh, wastewater treatment plants, and septic, all kind of residential and urban, is about 90% of the cost. And ag, uh, but that doesn't, you know, ag's about 10% of the cost, but not necessarily, the lows do not reflect that. So there's definitely a lot of heterogeneity across the different uh, uh, sectors. And if you think, I mean, the $14 billion is a lot, but you just, the easiest thing is just take the population of Maryland, six million, and that's roughly $2,000 per person. And for a family of four, you know, $8,000. So the real price, there's real ticket involved, uh, ticket price involved, uh, um, over the next 10 years or so. And this, if, so you can kind of see that, is that these, this orders of magnitude difference, you know, the ag sector here is uh, much less than, say, the, the regulated sectors. The Clean Water Act has now kind of put more of the emphasis on regulated sources through uh, originally wastewater treatment plants and industrial sources, but now more recently in the 80s and, and into the 90s on uh, MS4s, and stormwater, and there's been uh, moves in that direction to, um, to deal with that. And that's actually one of the more expensive ones. The, this opening slide is actually a rain garden. One of, one of the things we were looking at was incentives in Howard County for a rain garden program. Montgomery County has it as well. And these, these um, storm, the various um, stormwater BMPs, there's a variety even within sectors, a lot of variety in, in the costs and so on and so but a few you know, bioretention pond for a, for a parking lot for, to treat the impervious surface off a parking lot, a green roof in D.C., a bioswale, permeable pavement are all different options that are part of those WIPs to estimate costs. Stream restoration included. And then we have in the ag sector, we have, you know, a, a number of variety of, of practices, many of which have been talked about, and as you drive over here, you see a number of them uh, implemented. And as I said, the Clean Water Act is kind of the uh, driving force that's creating uh, the demand. You have these regulated sources, uh, wastewater treatment plants, and then um, which focus on the kind of point source discharge out of pipe. Wastewater, uh, urban stormwater was originally kind of conceived as non-point source because lawns and other kind of driveways are, have non-point source pollution, but because uh, stormwater systems have an outflow pipe, um, in, in, in most cases that there's, um, that they have been treated since 1987, the uh, legislation to have um, permits for under this uh, NPDES permits. And since then, uh, there's been, uh, every five years they get updated and, and now have been kind of brought into the TMDL system. And in general, this kind of regulatory approach has been important to kind of, uh, has made major strides in wastewater treatment plants and others. Uh, but obviously, each, if you have uh, pollution standards by a particular entity, there's going to be some variety of heterogene. There's going to be some heterogeneity in the abatement costs uh, across those uh, entities. And so, trading has been proposed and, and, and um, has has been both in water quality as well as air quality. And the idea is obviously, if there's heterogeneity in cost, then you can achieve a lower overall, uh, a lower overall cost, total cost of meeting the same environmental goal, in this case the TMDL or the cost uh, for meeting the regulatory uh, compliance. If there is that, that original slide that showed the figures, that, the figure with the uh, heterogeneity and cost by, uh, by different types, that's where the potential gains from trading occur. That's voluntary, so people can still continue on with just the internal option only, doing the regulated, uh, um, option only, but they can also move to uh, looking for that off-site mitigation. That kind of flexibility is, 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 is now being enabled. And on top of that, it allows even something that is regulated, like a wastewater treatment plant or stormwater, to go beyond, uh, uh, look for more innovative technologies or whatever, if they can do it, or maybe trading in time where they, they achieve the objective earlier than another one, another one's upgrading later. There can be that kind of trading in time. So. Um, as I said, the, that 
if anything, the water quality training has been talked about since the 60s as far as a, the textbook, one of the original text, textbooks and, and articles in, came out in 68. So that's you know, 47 years. And, um, but sulfur dioxide trading um, was one of the original ones where it kind of worked like that textbook example through the uh, Clean Air Act amendments in 1990. And then with Kyoto and, and um, with uh, carbon dioxide trading, and that's moved on to other examples of uh, CO2 trading uh, with active carbon markets in places like California, the Northeast, and even places like China are experimenting with uh, cap and trade type programs for water, uh, for air quality, and this will only kind of increase with the Paris Accords that happened uh, last month, um, that uh, market-based mechanisms will, will likely be a component of um, dealing with um, of this kind of uh, trading. And Maryland has a long experience as well. I mean, we kind of think oftentimes we're focused on air or water, but land use based trading, uh, two of the well-known, even when I was working in California and as a graduate student and learning, I, most of my research is actually on modeling urban sprawl at a parcel level, and Maryland has great data for that. I've been working in Maryland and California, but when I was studying it as a student in, uh, at Berkeley, basically, Calvert County and Montgomery counties were two of the examples that if you look at the land use planning literature, that those are two cases that have been uh, well developed. And this is where zoning sets the cap and you retire um, uh, uh, development rights in rural areas for farmland and forest protection and then a uh, developer will develop more units in an urban area and that kind of training occurs. As well as the Forest Conservation Act, which is unique to Maryland, uh, but there's been mitigation banking for forest, uh, forest conservation in places like Carroll County and others. So the SO2 trading program deserves some attention because that, that's one that actually is held up as when it can work at its best. Um, and the Clean Air Act, if you go from 1970 Clean Air Act amendments, which were regulatory uh, only, and then the 1990 amendments uh, that came a couple decades later, that the Clean Air Act, the, the amendments actually allowed, in, in this case, usually, you know, think large coal-fired power plants in the Midwest trading amongst each other, and they were able to meet a goal, say, uh, meet a goal trading across these coal-fired power plants uh, and, and reducing acid rain uh, that, uh, that sulfur dioxide um, creates, saving hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And, you know, this kind of within-sector trading worked in many ways because Air emissions across, you know, you can have coal fire plants across different states. Uh, it's easy to monitor these sources. They're large, they're selling, ton, you know, thousands or millions of tons. And so the transaction cost to negotiate is much easier. Now this to some degree fits into the model of wastewater treatment plants that are also pretty large. You know, maybe they have to work within the same basin or watershed, but um, so there's maybe not there, but they, you know, the, the, the thing where plant A upgrades a little bit earlier upgrades beyond their, their um, exceeds their baseline, can sell those credits to another uh, wastewater treatment plant that might want to upgrade later. That kind of trading in time is something that's been uh, looked at and, and, and um, could work in that, kind of, uh, in that kind of setting. Now across sector, and that's something that people have been coming up, we've been talking about more, is, you know, is across uh, with the, particularly the ag sector. I mean, the, the buyer could be a wastewater treatment plant, um, it could be uh, MS4. I mean, the, 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 uh, these are just, you know, looking at it broadly across the four sectors, whatever that would be. And I'll just give a simple numerical example. You know, not detailed, but just example to kind of underlie what we're talking about. Without trading, the, the these are the kind of cost savings. You know, say, for example, you have a point source and it's regulated. It has to work uh, annual reduction of 1,000 pounds the um, annualized cost of upgrading is $30 per pound. Similar to the slide, the earlier slide, that was about what the wastewater treatment plant would cost. And so without trading, it, it costs about $30,000. If you allow trading, and the Ag BMP uh, is adopted and sells offset credits for about uh, an annualized cost of $10, um, this would include whatever they're installing, uh, verification, all that. And the plant still upgrades half, they do, kind of a partial fix or management efficiencies, whatever that is, and then they buy half, then basically they're, they're, they're internally it's $30 per pound, that's $15,000. Externally they're buying credits for offsite mitigation at 5,000. And so the savings 
from 30 to 20 is $10,000. That's the potential. Okay, there's going to be transaction costs and other kind of things, but that's the potential. And with stormwater, that would be exacerbated. Rather than 30, this might be $100. And um, Ag BMPs, for the most part, what we have is we, we, we have most of the Ag BMPs are uh, cost shared. Or I should say, actually, there are, there's a lot of, you know, cover crops are definitely one that has, that most people won't do without the money. I've, I've actually worked quite a bit both in Ohio and Maryland. We have a survey, an ongoing project looking at the MAX program in cover crops. And there's high additionality. What we mean by that is that if you didn't pay the farmer, they wouldn't do it without, it, without the money. That said, a lot of other practices are, most practices, you'd be surprised, are self-funded, like conservation tillage, other kind of practices. Farmers are doing a lot without cost share money as well. Um, but the ag being, but overall, the, the idea with the trading is that because ag is not under the NPDES system of a regulated source, that to deal with that, they set a baseline of pollution that the low that the farm must achieve to be eligible. They have to get to that baseline, and then when they go, they clean up even farther, those extra credits can be sold. Now, if you make a really strict baseline, you're going to generate additional credits as they have to, they, that would not occur otherwise, but you also discourage participation. It gets more expensive. The farther the more the farm has to do to meet the baseline at their own cost, it makes it more expensive for those that they go farther below and can generate and sell. Market structures, there's a number of different ones. I mean, the, the um, top, top couple are more, most um, similar to what Maryland structured on, which is the, um, through the through an online website, but you can find each other, kind of like a used car market to some degree, finding each other, or using aggregators, particularly because farms are smaller than wastewater treatment plants, so aggregators might need to collect the credits from a number of farmers. But there are different, there are, in other, and I, my charge in many ways, while I was talking somewhere about Maryland program, was to talk generally about uh, other programs that are in other parts of the country. And in other places, they oftentimes use um, other mechanisms. So while in this area, it's more some kind of negotiation, individual buyers and sellers making contracts, possibly uh, through, uh, you know, most likely through uh, brokers or aggregators, there are other mechanisms, for example, the program that we studied in, in Ohio, the Great Miami, which is a small pilot program that started around 2005 and has, been, uh, um, um, has met many rounds of bidding. The idea is that many farmers would enter into, they would enter a bid. They'd work with the SWCD agent to do a BMP, say cover crop or riparian buffer. That would give them a certain number of pounds um, they'd say, I need this much money, request this much money. Say, I need $5,000 to do something that's going to produce uh, um, 1,000 pounds. They would bid $5 per pound. And um, the agency would um, collect all the bids and rank them from lowest to highest and accept the ones that provide the lowest, the, the most cost-efficient bid. And the farmer could actually cover their BMP and make even a little bit of profit if they want a bit higher, but they have a lower chance of getting in the program. Or they may use it kind of like a cost share, where they, you know, they say, well, Equip will pay me 65%. Maybe I'll get 85% cost share from this by doing this kind of thing. But anyways, the far, the, actually, the, the bids that were actually used was $2 per pound for nitrogen was the bid, the, the, um, the uh, threshold that they used for this program. It still had an active, uh, active, um, active program with hundreds of, hundreds of uh, funded ag BMPs. Now, there's a number of challenges, and I'll pro provide these as challenges, but also solutions in the coming slides um, uh, for nutrient trading, broadly. Transaction costs, particularly with smaller, farmers are relatively small compared to, say, a coal-fired power plant, a wastewater treatment plant that's, you know, uh, selling in much higher quantities. And to some degree, the market, uh, market structure I said in the prior slide talked about aggregators and other kind of people that would get involved to try to, um, to smooth that. Because there's learning costs. And farmers could have to spend a lot of time with the aggregator can take that information and find farmers. They'll help with that. Another thing is, while there's a lot of, Maryland's been very um, progressive and other states as well have, have, um, uh, have used best available science expert panels. There's so much, inf there's so much, so many meetings that go behind trying to estimate these models. There's still a lot of variability. Science is uncertain, just like climate models are uncertain. The climate science is uncertain. 
um, you know, what actually happens on a particular farm field and so on, so there's going to be some degree of uncertainty, obviously. So that's dealt with through trading ratios, baselines, other kinds of things. Buyers of, can be, uh, one of the concerns with water quality trading has been that buyers are ultimately responsible. If you do it internally, you know what you get. If you buy something off-site, you have some, you're still liable if that, if that fails. And there's pollution hotspots, that if you trade in one region, if you, if you continue to pollute one region, buy, buy from another basin, then uh, you'll concentrate pollution. And that's both an air quality, water quality, it's kind of pollution hotspot idea. So one of the things for, the, for dealing with uncertainty is that you just increase the trading ratio. For example, if there's a safety factor built into the, uh, so that, for example, a trading ratio of two to one would mean that the farmer has to produce two credits, two pounds for every pound that, um, that the tr treatment plant is uh, reduced from their permit. Uh, in Maryland, I think the ratio is 1.1 to 1, but, which would be 11 to 10, but the idea is that that extra credit is, um, dealing, is to help with the uncertainty, as well as it creates an insurance pool. If the buyer is still responsible, you've built in extra credits uh, that, will, um, that if an individual um, purchaser um, has a, is contracted with a, a BMP uh, from an ag, ag owner that fails, or maybe is not verified for whatever reason, then, um, then there's some kind of uh, banking system. Now, the higher the trading ratio, the stricter the baseline, the more expensive that you're making. If you made a, trader, a trading ratio of two to one, that means it's twice as expensive to, uh, for that ag BMP uh, to compete on the market. Also, with hotspots, one of the ways that we, that, you know, we said with coal-fired power plants, they may trade across the entire Midwest, but one of the things to deal with the water quality is, is you know, focus in tributaries and, and, and basins is that they restrict trading across basins so that, for example, someone might, there might be a lot of urban demand in the Potomac in Montgomery County or, or so-and-so, and they might buy from Eastern Shore, but that's not allowed. So they're, they're um, so that there's um, restrictions on trading across uh, basins to try to reduce the pollution hotspots. And that's even further dealt with through delivery ratios, that if even in the Potomac, if one watershed is if within the Potomac, different parts of it, someone is buying, um, um, buying credits and continuing to um, discharge, and then uh, someone's selling credits and cleaning up better in, a, in a, say, a different watershed, that there's some kind of delivery ratio to figure out, to, to find equivalence. And those are important factors that, that to make sure that the overall Chesapeake Bay has uh, dealt with those kind of uh, dif differential loading rates. Now to sum up, I just think that coming back to this original idea that Maryland has a huge, it's quite urbanized state. I, I work with a colleague in Iowa, and they would love to have trading. Uh, what Kathy Kling's a well-known environmental economist, uh, ag economist at Iowa State, and they don't have urban areas. The lack of demand for water quality trading is not really the issue in Maryland. And we have quite a bit of, you know, uh, we have, you know, out of the $14 billion, $13 billion um, in urban areas that, that would be, uh, and growing, a growing population, six million and growing. And that significant variation, that kind of, this opening slide is kind of that potential. That said, there are a lot of issues, you know, that to be addressed, and I think people, there's the attention that's being given in over the last several years, and, and, and looking at other, other models elsewhere is important, but I think at least uh, lowering the cost is, is something that um, uh, $14 billion, I'm sure water quality training will play some role in that. And so um, with that, I'll just open up for questions. Oh, it's in the camera, yeah.